The topic about space objects is a highly contentious one. These supposed impossible discoveries are often used by ancient astronaut theorists and others in areas of fringe science to support their beliefs. Sometimes it is an obvious hoax, like the 2012 art piece Babylonkia, a clay tablet shaped like an old Nokia phone with Babylonian numerals. Although the artist didn't intend it to be a hoax, others later used photographs of the sculpture to claim the discovery of an ancient cell phone. However, many out-of-place artifacts are genuine in nature, even if not in interpretation. And today we're going to look at four artifacts that many believe should not have existed, as well as the alternative explanations from mainstream scientists and historians. It was the fall of 1956, and amateur archaeologist Guy Melgren had traveled to the coastal city of Brooklyn, Maine. His goal was to locate and excavate a shell midden, essentially a Native American dumping ground for shells and bones that can be used to study dietary habits of past settlements. Instead, Guy came across a stranger by the name of Goddard, and Goddard offered to let Guy excavate on his shoreline property. Every summer, Guy would return to Goddard's site to excavate, with over 30,000 artifacts being discovered in total. The majority of these were stone artifacts, but there was a single corroded coin discovered amongst the other items. Guy wasn't particularly interested in coins, so he didn't think a lot of it. Eventually, he had a numismatist friend of his examine it, and it was declared that the coin was a British penny from the 12th century. Now, this should have already been a major discovery, as a medieval coin from England appearing in the United States would certainly require a little bit of explaining. But like we said, Guy wasn't particularly interested in coins. He basically saw it as a neat trinket that he could show off to friends or schoolchildren. However, an article was written in 1978 regarding the coin and its providence that brought it to the public's attention. People began discussing the possibility that the British had visited America before Christopher Columbus and debated the implications of such a discovery. Hello everybody, I just wanted to take a moment to tell you about a virtual hero of the internet world, and that is today's fantastic sponsor, Surfshark. Imagine this, here at a cafe, you're sipping on some much needed coffee, and suddenly you get a notification about a great deal on a site that's been blocked in the country you're in. Oh no! Well don't worry, with Surfshark you could just Click a button and hop on over to a country where you can take advantage of that deal. And speaking of hopping over to other countries, Surfshark transforms your device into a virtual passport. Maybe you're in Spain, you're on holiday, but you want to watch Canadian Netflix. Easy. Connect to a Canadian server and voila, it's sorted. Plus the security, Surfshark is like a mask for your internet life. It encrypts your data, making it unreadable to any prying eyes. And get this, and it keeps you safe on public Wi-Fi, so no more worrying about shady networks. Surfshark has your back. But that's not all. Surfshark comes with an epic security combo, alert, antivirus, search, your personal guardians against online threats. And get this, one subscription, unlimited devices. Share the love and stay secure without breaking the bank. And now here's the scoop. Black Friday is around the corner and Surfshark's got a deal that you can't miss. Use the promo code SIDEPROJECTS at surfshark.deals forward slash SIDEPROJECTS and you'll score an incredible Black Friday deal. Six additional months for free. Step into the world of internet security with Surfshark. Don't miss out on the Black Friday deal. There's a link below. And now back to today's video. It wasn't until two weeks after Guy died that the announcement was made that the main penny was not a 12th century British coin. The coin was actually a Norse silver coin minted during the reign of Olaf Kerr, most likely between 1067 and 1080. This was a huge development, as all other claims of Viking artifacts being found within the United States have been proven to be hoaxes or forgeries. The main penny, on the other hand, has been confirmed to be an authentic Norse coin from the 11th century. There is no debate over the authenticity of the coin, which could have major implications. It's well established that the Vikings traveled to what they called Vinland, an area encompassing northern Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. However, Leif Erikson landed there around 1000 AD, and the settlements were short-lived. It's believed that Vikings only settled on the North American continent for about a decade max, likely due to disagreements with the indigenous people. It's also believed that these settlements never extended nearly as far south as the United States. So, how exactly did this coin appear in Maine? Is it possible that these settlements lasted much longer than previously believed and they extended further down the American coast? Theoretically, yeah, it's possible, but historians believe that there's a more likely explanation. Just because the coin was found at the Goddard site doesn't mean that the Norse ever set foot there. Evidence shows that the site was a hub of a large Native American trade network, meaning that the coin could have been brought there from Newfoundland. This is supported by the fact that of the 30,000 artifacts excavated from the Goddard site, the main penny is the only one of Norse origin. The Goddard site was dated to between 1180 and 1235, during which time the Olaf Kyr silver coins would have still been in circulation.
circulation. That period is also while the Norse controlled Greenland, so it's possible that they made trading voyages to North America. When the main penny was found, it also had a perforation, showing that it likely was being worn as a pendant. While that area of the coin has since fallen off due to corrosion, the coin being fashioned as a pendant increases the likelihood that it would have been of interest to traders. Despite the fact that the coin is indisputably authentic, whether or not this is proof that Vikings traveled to the United States is a much larger source of debate. There is even discussion as to whether or not the main penny was actually found at the Goddard site at all. As an amateur archaeologist, Guy didn't do an amazing job of recording the specific circumstances of the majority of his finds at the Goddard site. It's reported that he simply wrote the letter C on a map showing the approximate area where the coin was found, with no other notes as he wasn't particularly interested in coins. But assuming Guy's story was true, it does leave a lot of an answer questions that have been the subject of debate. Even if the Vikings never traveled to Maine, the existence of this coin at the Goddard site indicates that they were continuing to travel to North America much later than was previously believed. The London Hammer is one of many out-of-place artifacts that have had similar origin stories. Whether it's the London Hammer, the Dorchester Pot, or the Costco artifact, these clearly man-made items have all been discovered encased in stone that allegedly formed hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of years ago. According to the story, the London Hammer was first discovered by Emma and Max Hahn while they were walking along Red Creek in London, Texas, in 1936. As they strolled down the river, the couple saw a wooden handle sticking out of a loose rock. The rock formation dated to the Lower Cretaceous period over a hundred million years ago, so the couple brought the unusual rock back home with them. They had been curious enough to take the mysterious rock home, but not curious enough to do anything with it. The rock sat at the house undisturbed for the next decade until their son broke it open to find out what secrets it was hiding. Inside the rock, attached to the wooden handle, was an iron hammerhead. The hammer was roughly six inches long, one inch wide, and clearly man-made. So, how could stone that was over a hundred million years old have formed around this man-made tool? Was this evidence not only that humans and human technology are much older than previously believed, but that humans once coexisted with dinosaurs? Uh, well, no, probably not, because it took nearly 40 more years for the London Hammer to gain any real notoriety. It wasn't until 1983, when young Earth creationist Carl Baal purchased the hammer for his Creation Evidence Museum, that it really started gathering attention. According to Balp, the London Hammer was an important pre-flood artifact, and its presence embedded in Cretaceous rock was proof that evolution was wrong and the Cretaceous period was not nearly as long ago as mainstream scientists wanted everyone to believe. That's certainly one interpretation of what was going on, though geologists have a much different explanation. According to them, a concretion had formed around the hammer. It's a common process similar to what occurs in a petrifying well. This would mean that highly soluble minerals in the ancient limestone where the hammer was found had formed around the object, a relatively quick process that can take place in only a few decades or sometimes even only a few years. This would certainly explain how modern the hammer appeared, looking nearly identical to hammers used by late 19th century miners in that part of the US. This explanation becomes even more likely when we examine similar objects, such as the Coso artifact. The Coso artifact was a spark plug purportedly discovered inside a 500,000 year old geode. However, when the supposed geode, actually just a concretion, was cut open, the spark plug was identified as being a 1920s champion brand device rather than the work of prehistoric engineers or alien intervention. Though probably not as famous as the Saqqara bird, the Kimbaya artifacts, also referred to as the Kimbaya jets, are a series of gold figurine shaped like birds, insects, or possibly airplanes made by the Kimbaya civilization. The Kimbaya were a pre-Columbian civilization in modern-day Colombia. It's believed that their civilization began in the first century AD, though the lack of a written language makes this difficult to know for certain. The Kimbaya artifacts are dated to around 1000 AD, and they're intricate figures made of an alloy of gold and copper known as tumbaga. This alloy has a lower melting point than either gold or copper alone, making it more malleable, but it is also harder than either metal. These properties make it ideal for the sort of highly detailed metalwork that exists in these artifacts. Unfortunately, the origin of the Kimbaya artifacts forces a great deal of speculation. Not only did the people leave behind no written records, but we aren't even sure where these figures came from. Rather than being discovered through traditional archaeological means, they were the subject of looting in the 1800s. Their existence is only known now because somebody turned in 123 of these figures to the Colombian authorities. The prevailing opinion among archaeologists is that they were all looted from two specific tombs, but we can't know that for sure. This uncertainty removes some of the valuable context that could be used to help determine their exact purpose. 
As for the artifacts themselves, they depict highly stylized versions of an array of different creatures. There are birds and insects, as we mentioned, as well as frogs, lizards, and anthropomorphized characters. But for fans of out-of-place artifacts, these figurines look far too much like airplanes to ignore. Many of these golden trinkets, which were two to five inches in length, contain triangular wings and vertical tails, highly reminiscent of modern flying machines. Or perhaps ancient flying machines. Convinced that the Kimbire artifacts couldn't be anything other than model airplanes, two German men, Peter Belting and Conrad Lubbers, created scale models of the same figures in 1994. They affixed engines to their models to turn them into radio-controlled airplanes, and their flight tests were successful. For many, this was proof positive that the Kimbire had advanced knowledge of flying machines. However, mainstream archaeologists, those spoil sports, are less convinced. Those that want to believe these were depictions of airplanes tend to ignore the existence of the full breadth of figurines that were found. While it's true that those depicting birds and insects appeared capable of flight, those depicting frogs and turtles absolutely weren't. Acknowledging the existence of these other artifacts weakens the argument that they had to be ancient airplanes, as the presence of other stylized animals would make it much more likely that they are just stylized birds. And of course, it's no coincidence that the golden figurines of these creatures would have aerodynamic properties. Birds and flying insects are, in fact, aerodynamic. Shocking, we know. <laughs> That's why they could fly. It's no surprise that an artistic recreation of such creatures would exhibit those very same properties. And because these figurines were made with a highly malleable gold alloy, the sculptors were able to more accurately capture the features of flying creatures that made them aerodynamic. It's also not a coincidence that Kimbire artifacts and modern day planes would look similar. Some people just have it backwards. The bird sculptures don't look like airplanes. Airplanes look like birds, which is by design. When humans were trying to build the first flying machines, they spent a lot of time studying birds. After all, birds have been flying around for ages. So, I mean, it was natural we'd want to copy what they were doing. The Sevatherium is a member of the giraffe family, though with its antlers and short neck, it looks a lot more like a moose than a giraffe. It also went extinct about a million years ago. At least that's what we always believed. It's certainly what the fossil record seems to show, as no fossils of the creature have been found that can be dated to more recent than that. However, this assumption was thrown into question in 1928, when the remains of a war chariot were discovered during an archaeological excavation of ancient Kish in modern-day Iraq. Alongside the broken chariot and skeletal horse was a rather unusual and distinct piece of bronze work, a rain ring that had been once part of the chariot. These rings served to protect the reins from getting tangled, though they were frequently topped with sculptures similar to a cast hood ornament. In this case, the sculpture in question was of a four-legged horned mammal. The bronze animal had a ring through its nose, and a rope was connected from the ring to its leg. Initially, it was reported that the animal in question was likely a Persian fallow deer, and that the longer, multi-pronged antlers had simply broken off the figurine, leaving the impression that it still had horns instead of antlers. But after being examined by Edwin Colbert in 1936, he described it as a late-surviving and at least partially domesticated Sevatherium. The piece of bronze, dated to around 2800 BC, is obviously much more recent than the one million years ago when this species is believed to have gone extinct. Edwin agreed that the statue was obviously broken, but he drew attention to two knobs on the animal's head that were present on the Sevatherium, but not on the Persian fallow deer. This wasn't the only potential evidence of late surviving Sevatherium either. Cave paintings from around 8,000 years ago, found in India and the Sahara, seemed to depict an animal that resembled this ancient giraffe. Despite the lack of fossil evidence and the existence of artistic license, the possibility couldn't be entirely ruled out. In both the paintings and the rain ring, the proportions of the depicted animals resembled a Sevatherium more closely than anything else. For 50 years, it seemed like nothing would put this debate to rest. But then, in 1977, a discovery was made entirely by chance. German archaeologist Michael Müller Karp was visiting the Field Museum of Natural History, uh, where the artifact was located. Michael was in the museum storeroom when his eyes were drawn to a small box of dried mud. Inside the box, encrusted in mud, he discovered two branch fragments resembling green coral. These fragments fit perfectly onto the rain ring ornament, revealing themselves to be the broken off antlers. Yet, this still wasn't the end of the debate. The fact that the animal had antlers rather than horns made it unlikely to be a Sevatherium, but it didn't perfectly resemble a Persian fallow deer either. After the figure was restored in 1985, it was newly identified as being a Caspian red deer. While it is far more likely for the figure to be a depiction of a deer rather than a Sevatherium, particularly because it is known that they have been domesticated at least to some extent, it still isn't conclusive. 
It also doesn't help determine whether the cave paintings were depicting Cebatherium or some other animal. Unless fossils are discovered that prove the ancient giraffes actually survived until 5,000 years ago, uh, we may never be able to come to a complete consensus on exactly when they went extinct. All we can say for certain is that, well, it's definitely extinct now.